What's going on guys, it's Simo. So today I'm bringing to you my top five competitive budget decks for the March 2020 format. Now yesterday we did my top five meta decks of the format, but I'm fully cognizant of the fact that not a lot of you guys can afford like play sets of Pot of Extravagance or Lightning Storm or Appalosa or any of these other hundred dollar plus cards when it comes to playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh at the current moment. Because you know, there is ebbs and flows with Yu-Gi-Oh and sometimes it's cheaper than others, but at this current moment, it's actually pretty pricey to play the game. But that does doesn't mean we don't have options, so I'm bringing you these decks so you guys have some options available to you. My price range is about $100 to $150. That may sound expensive to some of you, but if you do want to play competitively, you do have to spend something, and keep in mind that's only a fraction of what you'd be spending on some of these other decks. That's like the cost of a single Lightning Storm right now, and you can get an entire main and extra deck for that price. So before I get into it, just want to let you guys know, if you want to pick up your everyday I'm Summon Insured, be sure to check the links down in the description, and I think you guys for all the continued support on the merch. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. Kicking things off with number five, we have one of the veterans of the top five competitive budget list. Not nearly anywhere towards the top like it usually is, but that doesn't mean it still is any less powerful, and that is Pendulum. So Pendulum's actually been in a weird place at the moment. It's been able to like top regionals here and there. It actually did pretty well at the most recent uh, UDS taking place in Bogota. I believe it got top four, um, but there are some more uh, more Endymion focused lists that have been doing fairly well as well. When it comes to Endymion or a Pendulum in general, you do have the Pendulum summoning mechanic to abuse on your side, and that doesn't cost you any extra, so that's usually pretty good. When we're looking at constructing a budget list, you have to kind of think to yourself, how can I do the most unfair things for the most affordable price? And Pendulum summoning is a very unfair mechanic, but also Pendulum inherently can just build these very strong boards, and you don't really have to pay a lot of money to do that. There aren't really any cards apart from like Appalosa, which you don't necessarily need in Pendulum, although it definitely can help. You've got so many cheaper options that you can already play in your Pendulum list. And then when you're going second, you just have the ability to just push through your opponent's resources and deal with them fairly easily. So again, when you're looking at these lists, think about ways that you can just kind of get the most bang for your buck. Pendulum is definitely one of them. And that's why I went ahead and gave Pendulum my number five slot. But coming in at number four, we have a deck that used to be all the way at the top of the tier ladder, but has definitely declined since the most recent Forbidden and Limited list, and that deck is Orcus. Now, what I love about this deck is that I have it on here for a few reasons, mainly due in part to Dual Overload. There's going to be a Dengirsu reprint in that set, which means Dengirsu is going to be much more plentiful and uh, easy for you guys to acquire. It was typically sitting around like 20 bucks a copy, sometimes upwards of 30, but now with that reprint, it's already looking at that like 10 bucks, and if there's plenty of them to go around, it can even fall lower than that. You probably are going to need to pick up an IP mask Arena, and that'll most likely be the most expensive card you need, but everything else in the Orcus deck is so cheap that you are able to afford it. Orcus gives you a lot of options for the price point, but there's one reason in particular I really wanted to talk about this deck, and that is also coming out of Dual Overload, and that is Union Carrier. So when it comes to Union Carrier and Orcus specifically, what's nice is that you're able to incorporate a card like the Dragon Buster Destruction Sword, or whatever the specific Buster Blader card I'm thinking of, I'll have the correct one on screen for you guys to see here, but when it comes to this, Union Carrier can equip this card to any of your Orcus. Specifically, you're gonna probably want to do it to like Dengirsu, and that way you effectively artifact scythe lock your opponent out of the game while also having it be protected with Dengirsu's protection effect, making it so that most of the meta decks won't be able to play since they are so reliant on the extra deck. That seems pretty good to me, and if we're going based off of what I said earlier about decks doing unfair things, that seems to be like a very unfair thing that Orcus can do. Orcus is very good going first, setting up a pretty formidable board since Orchestrated Babel is a very powerful card, and going second, it's very easy for you to climb up into Boral Sword Dragon. You can play the Scraps and Scrap Wyvern to be able to just pop your opponent's board and go in with Boral Sword. It's a very solid deck for the price point, and that's why I gave Orcus my number four slot. Now coming in at number three, we actually have a deck that was on the top five meta decks of March 2020, and that's Luna Light. Now, I will preface this by saying we're not going to be able to afford Appaloosa for this deck. This card is over $100, but the thing is you don't need Appaloosa to play Luna Light in any capacity. Yeah, sure, it helps, but it's not mandatory. The thing is when it comes to Luna Light specifically is that this deck is able to just churn out rank fours with ease, and there's a lot of really powerful rank fours at the deck's disposal. There's Abyss Dweller for all the graveyard-based decks, Tornado Dragon for the back row decks, you have the Time Thief specifically ones. More specifically, I'm talking about like Redoer. You can play Psyframe Lambda. Even if you end on like Psyframe Lambda plus a Redoer and plus like Dweller or Tornado Dragon, 
That's still pretty good. You're going to have a Gamma in hand for your opponent's turn. Redoer is going to rip a card off the top of your opponent's deck to potentially disrupt them on their turn. And either the Dweller or the Tornado Dragon acts as a third source of disruption as well. So you're looking pretty strong for your turn one boards. And going second, again, because you're able to just throw resources at your opponent because you can continuously get them back within Archetype Monster Reborns like Lunalite Perfume and all these other extenders that the deck has, it's actually a very budget deck. I think what precludes a lot of people from playing this deck is the extra that can get a little bit pricey depending on which card you decide to incorporate. But again, if you forego Appaloosa, the deck is actually relatively budget since most of the cards are low rarity or they've been reprinted and are just really not expensive to begin with. So there's plenty of them to go around. I think this is actually a very solid option. Also, from an investment standpoint, since we are going into Master Rule 5 in April, this is a pretty interesting deck to look at for that because since it is so reliant on Xyz and Rank 4s, since you're no longer you're going to be bound by the link arrows um, and you can freely summon your rank fours anywhere this is a deck that could actually get better over time because they can spam even more rank fours onto the field and this might be one of the biggest threats going into the april 2020 format so from an investment standpoint that looks pretty good but the deck is pretty solid at the moment as well and so for those reasons that's why i gave luna light my number three slot but coming in at number two we have yet another deck that made it onto the top five meta decks and that's salomon great and this is again thanks to in part to the release of Dual Overload and Signet Mining receiving a reprint. It's already brought the cost of normal copies of Signet Mining down to about 20 bucks. We don't know if the card is going to be short printed yet, but it's also going to be getting reprinted in another set. I think it's going to be in like a special edition or something a little bit later on, so that'll bring the price of Signet Mining down even further. And when you look at the Salomon Great list, Signet Mining was kind of like the only real expensive card in here because a majority of the cards in a Salomon Great deck do come from the Salomon Great structure deck. And yeah, you could argue stuff like Phantasme is good as well, but Phantasme isn't necessary in Salomon Grade, not nearly as necessary as Signet Mining by comparison. That's kind of just like an added bonus, but those are the real only expensive cards in here. If you can't afford something like, let's say, a Borosaur Dragon, you can go with something simple like a Transco Talker Update Jammer Package, which is just as potent and powerful as playing something like Borosaur Dragon. Again, you might see some Salomon Grade lists opt to play Appaloosa. It isn't necessary by any means. It's more of a luxury, and Salomon Grade is probably the most well rounded deck of the format because it has the tools to pretty much deal with any deck in any particular situation, especially going into game one. I think this is a very solid pickup. And again, it's kind of just a nice deck to have on hand because it's just a nice go-to if you don't really know what to play, especially at the genesis of a new format. And so for all those reasons, that's why I gave Salomon Great my number two slot. Now, before I get to my number one pick, I did have an honorable mention and that's anything that can play Mystic Mind. So remember at the beginning of the video, I said we want a deck that can do unfair things. Well, Mystic Mine is a very unfair card, and a lot of the times you'll see most players aren't main decking it out to Mystic Mine unless they're playing uh, some pretty roguish style deck, I would say, or they have like an inherent out in their deck, like say for instance, Salomon Great Rage, and when it comes to Salomon Great, but most players don't play a main deck out game one, so if you're playing any strategy that's playing Mystic Mine in any capacity, if you happen to draw the card or terraforming search it or set rotation, give it to yourself, and you flip it up like you might just win the game automatically and so I figured that was worth mentioning because you can throw Mystic Mine in a myriad of different decks but you could also just play like a Mystic Mine burn deck if that suits your fancy. There's a lot of different ways you could take it but like I said you want to go for the most unfair things possible and Mystic Mine is definitely one of the most unfair cards in the game. But that's going to go ahead and lead us to my number one competitive budget deck of the March 2020 format and if you haven't already figured it out I'm going with Shadal. Now when it comes to unfair things El Shadal Winda is an unfair card and a lot of top tier decks just kind of fold to a card that can't be destroyed by card effects and only limits them to one special summon per turn. Now you might be thinking how do we afford to play Invoke Shadal on a budget because invocations and the invoke stuff is very overpriced at the moment but there's been a Trickstar Shadal list as a matter of fact that's been making its way around and when you compare Trickstars to the invoked engine they actually have a lot of similarities right? Candina is kind of like Alistair where it generates you plus ones. Candina and the Trickstars are also light 
light, so they give you fuel for construct, and they can also be more aggressive in terms of pushing for damage because that's what the trick stars are very good at. So if you replace the invoked cards with trick star cards, you actually have something here. You have a deck that can be very aggressive, getting into construct as quickly as possible for OTKs, or you can just play the control game, sit on Winda, and that's probably just gonna be enough most of the time to win you a majority of your games. I think if you have the budget and you're really looking to play something, you should be trying to find a way to play Shadals in some capacity, just because Winda is that strong of a card. You can also play Super Poly in your main deck, which is incredible, not only for breaking boards, also good for the mirror match if you play against Invoke Shadal players who have a much higher budget than you do. I think at the current moment, there really is no better option. Trickstar Shadal or Shadal in general has to be my number one pick. So guys, that's gonna go ahead and do it for the video. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about your top picks for competitive budget decks for the March 2020 format. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. Just by showing your support in any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time.